Elections are not just about political candidates. Elections should focus on the people, their level of satisfaction with the performance of elected officials, and the role government plays in their lives. Insights on PBS Hawaii brings you an important series focused each week on a conversation led by residents from one of the island communities in our state. What quality of life issues matter the most to them in this upcoming election? Join residents from Hawaii Island for the next show in this series. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. Our look at the quality of life throughout the Hawaiian Islands moves to the eastern end of the state tonight. In studio last week were Kauai residents providing insight into the good and bad on the Garden Island. Tonight we'll hear from residents of Hawaii Island, which for obvious reasons is also known as the Big Island. It is the youngest and largest of the Hawaiian Islands and it's still growing. It has the second largest population but the fourth highest population density and it has the most farmland in the state. We'll hear from a reporter from the Kona side, a property manager from Waimea, a graphic artist from Hilo, and a second generation flower nursery owner also from the east side. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Sherry Bracken lives on the Kona side of Hawaii and is a radio presenter for Mahalo multimedia and a reporter for Hawaii Public Radio. Eric Tonoi is the president of Greenpoint Nurseries in Hilo, a business started by his father. Riley Smith is the chief executive officer of Lanihau Properties and is a member of the Waimea Community Association. And Deva Keola Nui was born and raised on her family's farm in Hilo where she lives today. She's a freelance graphic designer and a marketing consultant. Welcome all of you. We appreciate you making the trip to be with us here in Honolulu tonight. We want to start with a broad question that's posed to each of you, and that is the good. What do you love about living on the Big Island? And Dave, I want to start with you. Um, well, it's my home. It's where I was born and raised. So I think really, other than, you know, the wonderful people in my life, my family and friends there, um, the closeness with nature, being able to um, camp, dive, hunt, just be very close to raw nature, which we're experiencing right now, but um, that was definitely a draw in coming back to the Big Island to live. Eric, how about you? Um, small town values. I kind of like uh, growing up uh, in Hilo where when you're driving on the street, you kind of know who's on the street. Uh, <laughs> that can be good and bad, right? <laughs> yeah, you know that. Um, I think the majesty, the majestic um, environment we have. We have so many diverse climates on the Big Island and in our business so in growing or producing plants and flowers, that's important. And of course, family, friends, community. Uh, I think we like to live on the Big Island because we have so much family there, so much friends. So. Riley, I know that you grew up on this island but chose to make your home on the Big Island. What do you love about living there? You know, Hawaii Island is such a unique place. Um, you get to know your neighbors, the people that would live around you. I always tell the story about, I might go to KTA supermarket to get a loaf of bread and some milk, and I'll come back an hour later because you ran into somebody, you <laughs> talked to somebody, and especially like with Kupuna, you're, you don't stop talking to somebody until they're done. So you, know, you respect your elders, and there's a lot of good values, and when that, they're done talking to you, that's when the conversation ends. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's not like that in a, a busier place like Oahu or, you know, like that. So I think those are some of the unique characteristics that draw me and my family and my wife, where we want to raise our kids and our grandkids, you know, so it's, it's good values. Yeah, that sense of community is so strong. Yes. Sherry, what about you? What keeps you there? Well, my husband and I moved from the San Francisco area in 1994, and what kept us after the first month, you know, we just went to Hawaii Island to see how it would be to live on Hawaii Island. We'd had great vacations there, but we met people right away, and it is community. And even though it's a big island, it's a very small island. And I feel connected with people from all over the island. You know, I've worked with Eric and with Riley in different capacities, and the people on our island are just 
so focused on helping make our island better. And it makes me feel really good that that is part of that. And as everybody has said, we have a beautiful island and it's quiet and peaceful. Well, Madam Pele makes it slightly less so right now. But it, it's just community and nature are really important things. And the kind of business community that is focused on improving the economic situation of the island and people work together to that goal and I like that. Tell me about the other side of the coin. This is again for all of you but Sherry we'll start with you. What is the biggest challenge of living on the Big Island? Well fortunately I have personally not experienced this too much but what takes people oftentimes off the island is the need for medical care which cannot be provided on a neighbor island and probably never would be provided just because our population at 200,000 isn't the kind of population that would attract for example, vascular surgeons, heart surgeons, people like that. And that that's always a stumbling block, whether folks have to come to Oahu for treatment or they may have to go back to the mainland. Or as people get older, you know, eventually all of us get older. And can we live on our own? Where are we going to live? And sometimes you have to go back to the mainland or to Oahu to be close to family who will assist you as you get older. Yeah, I think that's a really big one, especially because Hawaii Island does have an increasingly aging population. The most aging population per capita. So yeah, that's a challenge. Um, Riley, what about you? What's the most challenging part about living on the Big Island? You know, um, I used to work for the County Department of Public Works, and so we took care of the roads, the wastewater treatment plants, uh, the traffic signals, uh, solid waste. And so because the island is so big, I mean, the district of Puna, you can fit Oahu in the district of Puna where Leilani Estates is. So, you know, one of the challenges is you have these urban centers that are 60 miles away. From where I live to where I work is 40 miles away in Kona. I live in uh, Waimea. Hilo 60 miles away. So a lot of the infrastructure is based in the urban cities, and then there's a lot of expanse of no infrastructure between the cities. So, you know... Modern roads, wastewater treatment, water. I think uh, Hawaii Island has 7,000 residents on catchment. Um, and that's very unusual on an urban island like Oahu. So some of the challenges are just how everything is kind of spread out. Yeah, and we want to draw your attention. The viewers just saw that graphic there. Just the sheer size of this island is something that I think a lot of people forget. But that um, comparison you gave of Oahu fitting inside just one of those districts mm -hmm. yes. um, is something for us all to think about. Eric, how about you? What do you feel is the biggest challenge to living on Hawaii um, Island? For, for us, I think because we're in agriculture, um, it's um, be, being able to find that balance with getting uh, the right crop to grow, um, the balance of how to produce uh, for local consumption and export, and then um, financing uh, your growth so that you can employ people, afford to employ people, and to get bigger than just a husband and wife type of operation. So um, the costs of um, farming is going up, and then the regulations are going up. So the challenges of um, being in agriculture, you, you really got to put a lot into it now. In you, you know, it's interesting that you point that out because Hawaii Island does have so many farms, and the rest of the state is so reliant on, on that island to produce so much of our food. Mm -hmm. So there is this, this big um, burden, I would say. Uh, we have a graphic that shows Hawaii Island has over 4,000 farms. What's interesting is that about half of them are somewhere between one to nine acres. So this is exactly what you're talking about. Small family farms that are doing the work of growing the tomatoes and the lettuce and everything else that the folks here on this island and others are consuming. Yeah. Yeah, if I could just add, I think one of the biggest challenges with farming is you're so fossil fuel dependent. Mm -hmm. So your, your fertilizers come from fossil fuel. Your boxes that come in to sense. take your products to ship out are dependent on fossil fuel to ship it, mm -hmm. move it around. And electricity and water so dependent on power. So challenges that are out of your control. A lot, lot, lot of the challenges are um, energy based, yeah. Yeah, as Riley is saying. Um, and as the energy gets more expensive, because our energy on the Big Island is very expensive, so the big concern is um, what's going to happen next year with um, our power plant or our uh, geothermal getting, having a problem in Lower Puna. And just yeah, because we've lost 30 costs. megawatts, I think, of power. And so it'll be interesting to oh, see yeah. how Hawaiian Electric Light Company addresses that, which they are addressing, but it's going to be different. Yeah, and we're going to get to the to the volcano in just a minute because I know that that is a, a big part of our discussion. Uh, but first, Dave, I want to go to you and ask you in a broad sense, what do you think is the biggest challenge to living on the Big Island? <laughs> 
There's a lot of challenges, but I think, um, especially as somebody who recently came back, is jobs. A lot of my friends that are my age, that we grew up in Hilo, they just stayed on the mainland or moved elsewhere just because there's more opportunity, more diverse opportunities. On the Big Island, we already talked about agriculture, tourism, those are the main drivers. Um, and just, I hope in the future that we can work to open up more opportunity. Um, me, myself, I work with small businesses and I think a lot of it is being creative and flexible in what you do, um, especially being able to live on the Big Island, you, there's a high cost of living. You take lower wages, but it's a trade-off between quality of life. And I think it's worth it, but I, I hope other people can also come back. Well, wait, please go ahead. I just wanted to say that, you know, one of the things you mentioned was jobs. And one of our challenges, I think, is legislation. Because most of the legislators, the bulk of them, are from Oahu. And we on our island, I think, don't always get the um, understanding that we would need for them to make decisions that really work for us. For example, there's 50,000 cesspools on the Big Island, the most in the state, mm -hmm. and they have to all be shut down. That's a good goal. But it's also meaning that 50,000 people who have this size lot have to figure out a way to replace their cesspool with something else. And, you know, astronomy, that's another driver for our economy, and the legislation may not be in sync with the fact that that's a clean industry on our island and you know how we support that. So I think that legislation is a big issue as well. Well, I think if uh, the state hadn't been focused on the Big Island, they certainly are now. The, <laughs> the, the entire yes. world, perhaps, is focused on what's happening down in Puna um, and around Kilauea Volcano. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about, you know, I think there's this perception, especially internationally, that the whole state is on fire when we know that it is a very concentrated area. But this does have a ripple effect. You know, Sherry, you had a really interesting report on Hawaii Public Radio today just about the economic ripple. And I, I would love to talk to each of you about how you feel this eruption is affecting your own lives and that of your friends and neighbors. Um, but you don't necessarily have to live in Lower Puna to be affected by this? Oh, absolutely not. In fact, if you look at the west side of Hawaii Island, one of its main drivers is tourism. And although Ross Birch from the Hawaii Island Visitor Bureau will tell you that this month arrivals are up 27%, future bookings are down quite a bit, as much as 50% for some resorts. And this is people who they thought would call in and make reservations. So some of the tourist-related industries have laid people off already. Some of the hotel workers, some of the tour companies that particularly were focused on going into Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, they're not able to use their people. So that's a big impact for our island until things even out. Eventually, the lava eruption will stop, we assume. And we people, hope. Yeah, we <laughs> hope eventually. And people will come back. And you know that's going to be important. Hawaii Volcanoes National Park gets 2 million visitors a year. At least last year, that's what they got. Big tourist attraction. You know, and a lot of tourists go in there. That's, I think, one reason why some of the cruise ships have not, well, the Norwegian cruise line isn't going to Hilo because they can't take their folks up to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. So that's affecting everybody because if the unemployment goes up because of that, you know, it affects all of us. These are our neighbors, our friends. Mm -hmm. You know, Eric's business, I don't sell flowers, but if Eric can't, where am I going to get my flowers? Right. <laughs> well, um, and, and how are you seeing that affecting, you know, even if you're not in that area directly, how is it affecting the people that you interact with? Well, um, we're in Upper Puna. We're very fortunate because we have trade winds right now. So the, 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 the lees, the vog, the ash is blowing, hopefully, out to o the ocean right now. Um, but the lower Puna area, anywhere close to these fissures, um, they're having to deal with on an hourly basis. And so those farms are, are really taking a lot of um, anxiety, a lot of stress. Um, now, th this volcanic eruption is coming four years after Tropical Storm Izel, as well as um, the lava flow that th they came really, really close to Pahoa. And a lot of the people that we work with uh, four years ago were, were really, really um, frozen in time. They didn't know what to do. And then they started uh, coming back now, and this eruption is just, just taking them back to that four years ago. And so they're, 
they're really, really running scared right now. And I wonder, you know, in the agriculture community, what are some of the concerns in terms of the environment itself? When you talk about the ash mm -hmm. fall that we're seeing, we talk about the potential for acid rain, things like that. What are the worries there? Well, I, I know of uh, at least three uh, nurseries that got seriously damaged by uh, the SO2 or just being run over by lava. And so these people are losing all their livelihoods with, you know, 30 plus years of work. All of their investments are, they're seeing it um, pretty much disappear in front of them. Uh, some of them have voluntarily evacuated. Uh, some of them can go back, so they're still going back unless they get cut off and then um, the danger is that 132 gets cut off and 137 is cut off and then eventually you cannot get to your farm even if the lava doesn't take it over because uh, you, you, civil defense won't let you in. Right, there's no access. Because of no access and air quality, so the danger, you know, the health and safety. So a lot, a lot of people down there are, um, at, are first at risk of health conditions, you know, the ash. Um, I understand that um, Pele hair or this ash has affected some nurseries in the Pahoa area recently this week. So they're getting some damage, and the damages to like anthurium are, it's, it's like a bluing uh, coloration to the blooms. Mm -hmm. uh, SO2 burn is like a secondary, right? After the, the glass pierces the, the epidermal tissues of the flowers or the leaves. So that, that is happening not only to your crop, but it's also uh, subjecting either to your family or to your employees who, you, who, who are working on, on these nurseries. So at, at one point, the danger is that it, it might get too dangerous where you don't want to go out, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, Deva, I know that you said in your own family um, you have an auntie who's been personally impacted, and, and the hard thing about this particular natural disaster is that there's no end in sight. Tell us about some of the concerns around that. Yeah, I actually just saw her today, and I mean, the first thing was just to give her a big hug, and the main thing is safety right now, just because we don't know when it's going to stop, we don't know where it's going to move. And it's really scary to lose your home. For her, she's the head of Kua Okala um, Public Charter School. And so they've relocated to Hilo. But just last night, Civil Defense called her, 4 AM, the lava's heading towards your school. Come get everything out. And so she had to go and just get everything that she mm -hmm. can. But um, yeah, it's, it's really tough just not knowing. Um, there's, you know, minor impacts, and then there's, I'm sure there's things that we don't even take into account that will affect us for years. Um, as a surfer, there are two places that regularly get surf on the east side, Honolii and Pohoiki. Pohoiki has been closed for weeks now, and um, so many more people are surfing at Honolii. And it's, it's definitely a quality of life thing. You know, it's minor, it's not like, you know, my home was lost. But it's it's something that I think, especially Hilo, will be impacted um, by more people from Puna coming and um, just being in the town and using the resources. Yeah, that's an impact I had not even considered. <laughs> um, Riley, you know, where you are, obviously you're miles and miles away from the eruption itself, but how have you seen that impact your community? You know, even up in Waimea, we've had a lot of Kona weather lately, so there are a lot of bog impacts. Um, regarding the long-term issues having to do with the eruption, you know, with Izel, you had an event and then you could recover because you knew it was over. Mm -hmm. But with this, you just don't know how long the duration is going to be. You know, I try to be really optimistic. Um, Sherry had reminded me earlier that the volcano has been erupting and putting lava into the ocean since the 1980s. So we've had VOG in, in Kona, we've had VOG on the west side, but there are many resorts and other developments that have prospered. Kuanaiki, which is in the Koloko area, it's right across an industrial park, it's next to the national park, it's in the flight path of the airport. They've had extremely good sales. Um, they hire two, three, four hundred uh, construction personnel every day. That money that they get paid trickles down into the economy. They shop in the stores, they buy vehicles, and that helps everybody in the community. And then if you just go down the coast, you know, Kukio, Hualalai, Maunalani, Waikoloa, the Mauna Kea Resort. Similarly, they've all been impacted by VOG. I think over time, 
thing, people will get more comfortable with it. And okay, there is a difference. I think at first Fox News was saying something that Oahu <laughs> was evacuating, you know. And so Ross Birch, I think one of his biggest challenges is to educate people that this is in the district of Puna. There are some VOG and Lay's issues, but it's not island wide. It's definitely not statewide. And we all just need to work together and help each other out. Mm -hmm. um, people that have been displaced in Leilani Estates, some of them are coming to the west side, staying in the, the parks. And I think we all just need to have some compassion and help them get through this really difficult patch in their lives. Mm -hmm. Eric, you brought up the issue of uh, the geothermal now being shut down. And we do have some video, or rather uh, photographs, to show of that just so people can get a sense of the, of the plant. Um, lava has now covered, I believe it's two wells there, and surrounded the area so that it had to be shut down. This uh, PGV. Uh, I believe supported about 30 percent of the island's energy so you know it doesn't really matter where you live this will have an impact. Sherry talk about that. Well it will and actually I wish now I'd talked with Jay Ignacio of Helco because that's a question I have for him but Helco has always had excess capacity which is really great for this island even when we had the 2006 earthquake you all on Oahu lost power. We did not lose power for as long. We had a very short power outage on Big Island because Helco has done a great job of balancing the power needs. But there is going to be an impact because that's 30 megawatts of power, which I think is around 25% of the island's generation. So we'll just see. You know, we haven't really been affected. I mean, we haven't had any power outages, no brownouts, blackouts. I think one of the big impacts for all of us, though, is. You know, you mentioned Susie Osborne, head of Kuokala Public Charter School. She's a friend. We all know people who are suffering, and even if you don't know these people personally, it's an emotional impact on all of us on the island. You know, this is our family. You know, this is our extended community that is being affected by this, and we just will be very glad when things can get back to normal, but that's not now. Um, on those back to normal issues, we have a lot of folks writing in, not necessarily about the eruption, but about just everyday quality of life issues that they're facing too right here. Um, well, several of these about traffic. This one is interesting. <laughs> uh, Anonymous from Kona says, the construction of Queen K Highway is blocking off half the highway, paving more lanes, but still making it a two lane highway. Doesn't help the horrible traffic we've always had. Uh, Riley, you do that commute. Um, Hopefully you take the well, upper road. I did, so. I, did that, I did that commute today to the Kona Airport, and I have good news. I was out there Saturday, and it was what this person said, but today they have opened the Malka to northbound lane. So there's two lanes going northbound. I don't know when they opened it, between Saturday and today, <laughs> and it was great. So did still one lane southbound. Did you tell that person southbound. to call it? <laughs> no, no, I just, I was, I, but I texted some, the folks I was with on Saturday to say, hey, guess what, they opened the two lanes. State DOT is yeah. opening that road in August. Yeah. You know, we're in June. So in three months, the road is going to be open. Yeah. It's going to have two lanes going in two directions. That impacts the traffic um, for the construction workers and the hotel workers that are leaving all the resorts and live mm -hmm. in South Kona. So it, it's going to alleviate a lot of those problems. Yeah. I mean, the State Department of Transportation, Ed Sniffin, their, their uh, highway deputy, has done an excellent job in getting that done. It, It'll be open, and it's going to alleviate so many of the problems on one main arterial right. that services West Hawaii. Between Kona Airport and about town, so it, it will be very helpful. We have a soundbite from the Hawaii Island Police Chief that I think will help address uh, this question. I want to call that up while we ask this. Tom from Honolulu says, why does East Hawaii have the highest percent of crime per capita in the state? Let's listen to the chief on his take on the drug problem uh, on Hawaii Island and beyond. The biggest dr drug of choice right now is crystal meth. And that's, I think, across the state. That's a drug of choice. Um, if you look at the price of crystal meth, it's come down drastically from before. So majority of the drug, all the crystal meth is being brought in. Being brought in, It's right. being trafficked in. A lot of it's so, male, right? Our challenge is how to get the trafficking stopped, how to address those issues. So we work with our federal partners, we work with the other counties. We, we got to work cooperatively across the state. As an, Because we're an island state, we have to deal with this as an entire state, not just a county. Eric and Dava, you both are from those areas. Uh, second generation, if I understand, actually third generation, correct? Uh, um, fourth generation. Fourth you're generation. Not, you're not on the island, but so, so second the, in egg, though. The, the <laughs> roots are very; they run very deep. Uh, tell us about how the crime has affected you and and your community. Uh, first of all, we run nurseries 
yeah, in South Hilo and in Upper Puna. Okay, um, we've had to have hire uh, our own people, security, uh, to actually stay on property at night, uh, and this has discouraged a lot of theft. Uh, they could primarily come to our nurseries to steal old trucks, and my understanding is that they they sell the trucks and they buy drugs. Uh, some of it is probably selling it for cash, maybe commercially they sell the parts from these trucks. And so it's cost to the business when you have to hire someone just to sit there, just to be a, a deterrent so that the thieves don't come on your property. Um, and then the second, the second problem is that um, it's a tough way of running a business when you, when you have to do that uh, for your nursery or your farm right. uh, because uh, the, the police have a tough time. It, uh, I don't blame them. Um, in rural areas, we're so spread out, it's very hard to police. Uh, a lot of our areas, in the rural areas, is not well lit either. So uh, the thieves know the area. They know how to get in, how to get out. A lot of them are pretty sophisticated. You'd, you'd be really surprised how much homework they do on spotting, on timing, and studying our pattern on when we come, when we leave. They know uh, seven days a week our schedules if they, if they want to try and steal something. So, um, so it's, it's a growing concern and you know, it, I think drugs is, is, a, is a concern. What more could be done for a business like yours to, to help your community? Um, I think we could do a lot to help ourselves like um, Neighborhood Watch. We, we, we are farmers or nurserymen and women, we could be more organized with na Neighborhood Watches. I don't think we're as organized as we could be there. Um, uh, I think I, we, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, um, I also think that we need to look at the deeper issues. On the east side of the island, we have some of the lowest um, housing costs and the highest rates of poverty. I think that um, more effort in mental health, in substance abuse help, um, could really help our communities. Um, crystal meth is, as I understand it, it's the drug of choice because mm. it's cheap compared to other substances. And it comes from, you know, there are other issues like domestic violence, you know, child abuse, a lot of mental health issues that um, just need more attention on our island. Uh, I could tell you, you know, uncle's truck, father-in-law's tailgate, my dad's lychee right now, you know, it gets ripped off, but I think as a community we need to look at, you know, why are these people doing this? What's driving them to do these things? Well, on that issue of economic opportunity, we have a graphic that I want to look at just about the median incomes. And what's interesting about this particular graphic is that it's broken down by county. You can see it there. Now, this is income per capita, so um, this takes into account everyone, people who make money and those who don't, of course, and sort of averages them all out. But if you look at that graphic in Puna, it's around $18,000. Just the next county over in South Hilo, you have almost a ten thousand dollar gap. Kau again around nineteen thousand. I mean, this is a; these are parts of the state that, as you're talking about, have a you know are very economically disadvantaged. Sherry, what do you think are some of the things that can be done to address some of these issues? Wow, um, <laughs> <laughs> the economy. You know, one of the concerns we have actually is that the economy will be taking a hit even more. And if you look at the areas you talked about, I think there's a, a greater older population, say in the Ka'u district. And a lot of folks, as you know, live pretty much on social security or not much more than that. And that's always a challenge. But Deva mentioned some things that, you know, there are social services that need to be available to people. If you look at this particular situation with people who just don't make that much money, Hawaii Island Food Basket feeds so many people. I, I don't remember the statistics, but they feed on a regular basis like something like 30,000 people a month. And now with the Puna lava flow and so many more people being displaced, they're really being stretched. So something has to be done to be able to find adequate funding because they can't just pick up these burdens. So on a specific basis for now, that would be helpful. And it's interesting when you look at the economic disparity between the different areas you're looking at, a lot of it has to do with employment. And I look at um, the chart right now over your shoulder <laughs> there. <laughs> Looks like uh, South Kohala has a pretty good income and that's sort of where 
the Waimea area comes in and the astronomy community and a lot of people do work in that particular industry which I think probably gives some of the folks a better salary than say some folks who live all the way down in Kau and couldn't really commute to get those kind of jobs. I think it really gets back down to the economy. I think in some of the areas you mentioned in Pune and South Hilo um, you probably have younger families too that are having children and they're working multiple jobs and so they're stretched to not be at home to guide their children. Maybe have latchkey children. The kids come home from school. They're unsupervised for hours. And so I, I think you know it really takes a village. You need everybody: the parents, the aunties, the uncles, the neighbors, to just keep track of the kids. You know, idle time is probably the the worst enemy for um, getting involved in things you shouldn't. I think it starts when you're young, but I think it also the, the economy is a big factor where you have, you know. The homeless in South Kohala, there are people that families, the mother and father might work two jobs, and they have to decide whether they're going to pay for housing or pay for food. And so they decide, we're going to pay for food and we're going to live in our car. They take the kids to school in the morning. My wife and a close friend are involved with the Big Island Giving Tree, spend so much time and effort to try to help the families that need the help and want to guide their children and spend the effort but they're just strapped financially to be able to make these life decisions about what can we afford to do this month. Well, on that point, Harold from Kona writing in saying the quality of life in Kona is strained. The gap between those who have and those who need is wider. What can be done by whom and how do we restore paradise? I and mean, this is a, a broader question I think that is evident on all of the islands, um, but a Harold is feeling it very much in Kona. Are, are, do you see that? Do you see that kind of gap that he's talking about? I think so. You know, if, if you look at where a lot of the people work on the west side, they work at a lot of the resorts, either in construction or service jobs at the resorts. But where they can afford to live is maybe South Kona or Ocean View. So they're spending hour and a half, two hours, 60, 70 miles to go from where they can get a job to where they can afford to live. And so it puts a strain on being able to raise your kids and being there for them and everything. So And the it, price of gas. Yeah. You know, you're spending yeah. a lot of time in your car, a lot of drive time and not sitting in traffic like here, driving in traffic. It just If you're driving two hours or an hour and a half to get to work, that's, that's a lot of expense. Uh, the graphic that we just showed showed all of the different towns, or the major towns, not all of them, of course. Uh, and it kind of goes to what George and Kona is writing us about. He says, the Big Island is so diverse and geographically stretched between services. Why has it not been divided into two counties yet? Hilo's needs differ from Kona's. Let's create two counties. Uh, Eric, what's your take on that? Can, can I just mention something? <laughs> <laughs> that constitutionally, that is not a decision that can be made by anybody but the state legislature. So you can comment. You. But, but <laughs> people, people sometimes think it's like, oh, let's just create a county, but we, we legally can't do that. Well, you know, it's like the debate in California between creating two states. And I, I do think um, the Big Island, I mean, he, he does have a point that the needs are very different uh, east side to west side and, and probably north to south as well. But do you feel cohesive as one island or do you think that the needs are so different that there should be two counties? Well, I, li I live in uh, Upper Puna, so I'm on the east side. But I feel we're one island, one community. Um, the, the obvious thing, first thing that comes to my mind is the cost. I mean, if you divide the island with uh, two populations and split it, the cost is, uh, I think, we'll, I don't think we'll be able to afford it. Um, secondly, um, you, the talent you know, to run two counties, yeah? So you want the best talent and you're going to try to run two separate counties on the same, now you can, you're going to be competing for the talent. So if you want to bring in talent from outside, now, now are you achieving, any, are you improving or are you not improving when you start wanting to bring in people from the outside? We, we tend to want to use uh, and help the people on our island yeah, first. Mm -hmm. It's always been the local way. So I, I, I see it, it would be difficult for me. We're one island. We're one <laughs> we are island. so one island. And we, you know, we care about Sorry, everybody George, on the I think, uh, I think the, the table has settled that one. Uh, one thing that, Deva, you brought up that I thought was interesting, just about the impact of, you know, your surf spot, for instance. Um, and, and, you know, that is a quality of life. And we have uh, two folks writing in. I want to read both of these. Uh, Anne-Marie says, she moved to Hawaii Island from Kaneohe in 1988 and loves that you can still extend your arms and not touch anything and you can feel the breeze. That's what she loves about her island. 
And you all talked about yeah. how what a wonderful place it is environmentally just to be so close to nature. Um, but someone writing in anonymously says, from Kona, says, I've noticed locals are avoiding their favorite beach spots because of the overcrowding tourists. I'm worried that beaches like Kua Bay and Magix will start to become Kona and Waikiki Beach. What are the chances that these local spots will charge for entry like Hapuna Beach? Um, I mean, the good thing is that if you show your ID at Hapuna, you don't have to pay, right? So, um, but I do think that that, uh, that that is a concern. You know, I remember when I was growing up, Makalavena was my favorite beach. Right. Um, they changed the road, and I went there not that long ago, and I was shocked at how many people were there. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that we've seen echoed throughout the state. But, um, you know, one thing that you talked about was just how much you love being close to nature. Do you feel like some of your favorite spots are being crowded out, volcano aside? Um, Yes and no. Um, I was fortunate to be raised going camping and even backpack camping deep into the national park where you really, you, you have to hike 10 miles to get there. Um, but I, I recently went back to um, this spot on a holiday weekend and I was horrified at how many people were there without permits too. Mm. And it was um, it was just really sad for me that, you know, even after hiking 10 miles, um, that, you know, it felt a little bit like when I lived on Oahu. But on the other hand, <laughs> are we really surprised that everyone wants to go to this beautiful place? Um, and even as someone who's born and raised there, and I do feel like, oh, this is my place, I understand. Um, but I think that there can be legislation to, um, you know, encourage the, the correct use of places, edu educate people about um, how culturally valuable certain places are, what's acceptable, mm -hmm. what's healthy for the environment. Um, so I think it's gonna happen. There's gonna be more people. It's just how we deal with it and um, talk to people about it. Right, there is a tension there because we talked about the lack of op economic opportunity. If we want these folks to come and enjoy the Big Island and stay in the hotels and rent the cars and eat at the restaurants, then we also have to share the beach, right? Well, it's a challenge. You know, the Hawaii Island Visitor Bureau and the Hawaii Tourism Authority have gone to great lengths to try to increase tourism, but it does create traffic jams and use of places where, you know, I will avoid going to places during heavy tourist times. In fact, somebody the other day who actually lives in Pahoa said, wow, it's kind of great because there's way less traffic. <laughs> Not that we're happy that people's homes are being destroyed, but, you know, and May is usually a little bit of a slower tourist month for us anyway. So I don't know, people have talked about, can, is there a way to somehow limit the number of tourists who come? Probably not, but. What about the kind of tourism that we do? Because it doesn't always have to be, you know, if people came and stayed longer, instead of, you know, just in and out, drive around the whole island, consume everything, try to do everything um, w versus actually have an experience that they learn about the island, that they're environmentally aware of what's going on. I, as someone from the Big Island, I, I mean, tourism is a double-edged sword. It and is. I, I hope that in the future we can um, have un other industries that drive our economy and maybe change the way that tourism shapes our lives? Well, there's a lot of organizations on the Big Island now that have tried to go in that direction. Hawaii Forest and Trail, for example, where you, you know, they, in a responsible way, take people to some of these attractions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is a lot of push toward ecotourism, but there's still a lot of people, as we all know. Riley, I saw you taking some notes yeah, there, so I, I have a feeling you have a point you want to make. I think balance is important. You know, I think it's yeah. important to share the resources with others. Um, my wife and I, we used to do a lot of stand-up paddling, but we do a lot of snorkeling now. So what we do, it's crowded, so we go to Wailea Bay on early, and we leave early. So we get to experience it. We found a niche where maybe sometimes we're the first ones in the water. We swim for an hour and a half, then we leave. And then, you know, we go do our chores at home or other things. So you find out when the uncrowded times are. Mm -hmm. You know, That's true. 
the company I work for, we, we manage a, a livestock ranch. We have a thousand mother cows. One of the most important things that I think all of us cherish on Hawaii Island is to be good stewards of the land, to leave it better than you found it. And that's really important with us because our 10,000 acres, we have Mauka, provide a watershed for the water to get into the aquifers. It uh, prevents siltation from getting down into the oceans. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it just comes back to, I think, a Hawaiian style of taking care of your resources, don't uh, de deplete them, mm -hmm. and just treat everything as if you might not have it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can share that with the tourists that come here, they're gonna see what a special place it is, and then they're gonna go back and just appreciate what a unique time they had. So I think there's a way we can balance those mm -hmm. things. Eric, I see you nodding your head. I agree. Um, as a kid, my parents uh, taught us, when it, wherever you go, you leave it cleaner than you got there. You know, pick up the opala, you know, take all your trash out, and then um, share. You know, because when we grew up, um, it, we didn't feel that certain places were only for certain people. I mean, we right. grew up in a nice time when we shared all the, the resources mm -hmm. with everybody. Um, but that, that takes um, education. Uh, to share. You, gotta, you have to be confident in yourself to be able to feel like you can share it. But we should also in, educate. You know, it's very important, I think, that uh, the visitors that come here understand that um, you're, they're coming to actually an island that people actually live here. This is not a fantasy <laughs> island. We, li we, we actually live here. You, you, they can leave, but we actually live here. So when we're opening up our home to them, uh, be respectful. Yeah? Take care of our home to respect the people and the culture. And schools do a good job of helping young people understand that as well, that we are all stewards no matter what our age. Riley, you know, we've talked a lot about Kona issues and Hilo issues, but we haven't really focused that much on Waimea itself. What are some of the unique challenges there as opposed to the rest of the island? Is this on film? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will know. Just tell me. I really don't want for people to know what a perfect place <laughs> um, we have a pretty diverse community. We have a Department of Hawaiian Homelands areas, um, thousands of acres of pastoral leases. We have the astronomy community. Uh, Canada, France, Hawaii, and Keck telescopes are based mm -hmm. in, in Waimea. They bring in scientists, very educated employees. Uh, education to them and, and their children are very important. So Parker School, where you went to for a little while, and uh, Hawaii Preparatory Academy were kind of created and nurtured by these astronomers and other educated people that came. Um, Richard Smart owned Parker Ranch for so many years. They used to own 150,000 acres. He left all of his assets to uh, four beneficiaries in the Waimea area, the two private schools, the Hawaii Community Foundation, North Hawaii Community Hospital. A lot of different groups that work well together. The Lalamilo Farmers, um, been farming there 60, 70, 80 years. All of them are very intelligent, very well educated. Their children grew up picking strawberries at six in the morning before they went to school, post school, come home and do the same thing. Then, you know, they, they go to medical school, they're, they're educated. And so really unique community. And then you tailor that with the resorts on the Makai side, plus the fishing community at Kauai High. Good balance, I think, um, very unique. Mm -hmm. What about the cost of living there, though? I lived in Waimea for three years, and just to find a rental, it was so difficult as a young person because you have so many different people coming in that can pay more than you. Yeah. It, you know, it's not perfect. Um, and that's an issue in a lot of places, too. Yeah, yeah. Waimea, Waimea, well, Kona too. being from Hilo, yeah. I guess it was really striking for yeah. me that Waimea was um, so difficult to find a place to live for somebody. And, and because here. of that, you know, that gives opportunities for other areas. Um, my stepson and his wife live in Poilo. They mm -hmm. bought a house. They're 25, 26 years old. They were able to get the money together to buy a lot. They were able to camp out on the lot while they're building their house. So, you know, it depends your level of commitment and how hard you want to work. Um, and if it's important to you, you'll figure a way, mm -hmm. but there's no cookie cutter, this is how it's gonna work for everybody. Yeah. Um, 
your mom lives in Javi, and it's a much less expensive place to live than, say, in Camuela or Donatello. More Resorts. rain, not nearly as, <laughs> uh, you know, not the, not the same kind of resources. I think Waimea is a lot is ideal for a lot of people also because you have the hospital right there, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. as somebody, yeah. you know, that's something I think about having a parent that lives in Javi, and, you know, if she needs an ambulance, how long it's going to take, right? And Very I think, important. you know, you brought up the issue of, of medical resources on the big island. I think given how spread out it is, I mean, that's a big draw for Waimea yeah. is that you've got the medical center right well, there. And Queens Hospital took over the operations of North Hawaii Community Hospital and the amount of resources they put into that hospital. They fly in surgeons. Uh, my wife had surgery about a, two months ago. The surgeon came in from Queens on Oahu, did the surgery, did like a couple other things, flew back. But they have the resources to bring in those folks that are very specialized and very, a lot of expertise to conduct these things where you live so then your recuperation and everything is much better because then you don't have to get on the plane to go home. And you're home. Fifteen minutes later, you're at home. Yeah. You know, so that helps with all the healing and, mm -hmm. you know, the mental anguish and everything from the stress of going through these yeah. procedures. Well, we all need to strike it rich and move to Waimea, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I want to note, we do have two other hospitals, Hilo Medical Center course. and, of course, Kona Community Hospital, and they're both part of the state health system. Not privately owned, as is Queens and North Hawaii, and they have definite challenges the flying people over to Oahu or to Maui for care as needed and the funding because it's hard to make money as a hospital if you don't have funding. You know, this show is really, the, this series that we're doing is really to draw attention to each of the islands and also to kind of set the stage for our conversations that we have with the candidates going forward. What are the issues specific to the Big Island that you wish got more attention? Sherry, we'll start with you. Well, I can tell you that in any candidate forum for governor this year, for example, we would normally be asking about improvement to the economy, but now with the lava flow, our island is going to be facing severe economic challenges between the loss of tourism, the loss of the housing, the how do we recover. So I'd say the economy is a big issue. Riley. You know, similarly, I think the state legislature, the governor's race this year is so critical. Um, you know, you look at the trans transit accommodation tax and, you know, all the money or a lot of the money is generated on the outer islands, but it doesn't in stay there. Mm -hmm. um, so just really challenging. Again, you know, you look at infrastructure, everything's so spread out and the services that Hawaii Island is going to require, especially with the eruption that's going on and all the services that are just to get back to square one again. Mm -hmm. Eric, what do you wish that legislators and lawmakers paid more attention to? Um, because I mean agriculture. Um, our Department of Agriculture, um, uh, as a percent, it, it, it gets less than a 1% of the state budget. Um, and if we're going to do anything significant in agriculture, uh, we have to look at that. Uh, I'm not saying the number that needs to be increased, but I think uh, a balance needs to be struck. Um, how much does the department need to uh, be able to afford good programs? And then secondly, who we put in charge how they execute those good programs to help agriculture um, thrive uh, statewide, not just on the Big Island, because we have communities and hungry mouths all over the state. Uh, the, the second thing I think is m more closely maybe to Puna would be, we, uh, you look at the size of the district of Puna and what, what Riley said was the island of Oahu can fit in Puna, and yet uh, the Department of Transportation is struggling to widen that Highway 130. If we could widen that highway and give good transportation to Pahoa that connects Pahoa to Keau to Hilo, uh, what that would do is, for example, um, an emergency vehicle coming up from uh, Lower Puna or Pahoa to, um, they got to go all the way to Hilo. They could probably make that trip uh, much faster and safer. And of course, uh, alleviating uh, all the stress on uh, the morning and evening traffic for Puna people from Pune coming into Hilo to either work or play. Um, these, are, these are things I think that um, not difficult, um, I mean, uh, difficult problems to solve, not easy to solve, but uh, I think that transportation, if you're going to develop in a smart and balanced uh, way um, from the gateway city uh, or town of Keau and go to Pahoa, you, you need to have a good um, vein or good highway to get in and out so that people can get in and out as well as um, emergency vehicles, fire, rescue. I mean, you bring up, bring up some great points. Do you feel like you have enough of a voice in the state conversation about those resources coming from where you're coming from? Um, Puna, 
<laughs> to be honest, uh, we're like the Rodney Dangerfields, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, Pune, you know, it's, it's a huge district, right? Um, we, have, um, we have low um, land costs, so we have more affordable housing. And so, so many people are moving to Pune. But the reason why the housing, if, if the reality is, is because of the infrastructure. We have less infrastructure, yeah? So, powers to be, whoever is making the decisions at the ledge or, or in the administration, need to understand we need a long-term strategic balanced plan that is committed uh, to develop um, from KL down to uh, even down to Pahoa, so that so at least all these people are moving in these subdivisions. Many of these subdivisions are private, so we really need to be smart about how the county and state works with these private subdivisions, so that the subdivisions can be strategic too in developing their roads and water. Mm -hmm. This needs to be a community plan. I mean, with the developers as well as with the government and the private sector, it cannot. It, no one. Uh, segment can do it all by themselves. We, we really need to uh, collaborate to form synergism. David, tell us, what do you wish lawmakers were paying more attention to? Um, it's probably invasive species. For me, in my lifetime, um, you know, it used to be quiet when you go to sleep in Hilo. Yeah. Now, koki frogs are just a part of life. Um, little fire ants are another thing that just recently is a big problem on the Big Island. Um, Albizia trees are um, a huge danger. We had that in um, Izel, mm -hmm. where it caused so much damage. Um, and these are things that, again, they just need more funding to do um, education and also the inspections for the Department of mm -hmm. Ag. You know, we're islands, we're very, um, fragile ecosystems and bringing things in affects quality of life, it affects tourism, our economy. Um, so I think that's something that it's not as um, in the spotlight as education or just the general economy, but for me it's something that really affects quality of life. We Angie, have, can I mention just one quick thing? Homelessness, nobody's really talked about that, but we do need to have an overall, I'm sure we can do it, even though no place in the country has done it, but a fix for our homeless problem, Hilo, Kona, Waimea, everywhere, which now is exacerbated because now we have a whole group of people who are homeless who didn't expect to be. We want to get to one last question. We just have a few minutes left. Okay. Um, and this is something posed to all of you, if, and if you could be relatively brief. Uh, former Big Island Mayor Billy Kinoy is credited with posing an interesting question, and we pose it to you tonight. As a resident of Hawaii, do you believe we are a state of islands or an island state? Riley, what is your take on that? You know, we all need to collaborate. When Mayor Kinoy was there, he settled so many differences between East and West Hawaii. We're one island, we're one state, we need to work together, uh, we need to share information. Um, you look at everybody that's responded to the crisis in, in Leilani Estates, I mean, con federal congressmen are there, the governor's there, you know, civil defense, FEMA. Um, that's the kind of response we need from everybody. You know, there's a need there, everybody needs to show up and let's figure out how to make the burden less. Um, so I, I'd say we're all one, you know, don't, put divides where they don't need to be. Sherry, I see you nodding. What is your take? Well, what he said about Mayor Kanoi is true. There used to be controversy about East-West, and one of the callers brought that up, but really that went away under Billy Kanoi, and so I think togetherness is where we are. You know, we are certainly one island, but we're also part of this state. You know, this state belongs together. We're a state that's isolated from everybody else, so we need to be together David, what's your take on that? Do you feel like we're united as a st or, or a bunch of different islands? I think the best way forward is to view ourselves as, as united. And I think all the issues that we talked about here and all the other issues that we didn't get to talk about are also issues on other islands. And, um, and more and more we're a global economy. You know, information travels faster than it ever has. And I think that we need to have foresight in where we want island life to go sustainably um, in order to move forward together. Eric, we'll give you the last word on this. Do you feel like we're an island state or a, or a state of islands? Um, well, I kind of like the, the phrase um, state of islands. 
I think we're, uh, we're all islands with, with our own communities, unique communities, um, <coughs> like the Big Island, all islands, we all have our unique personalities. Um, coming from Puna, coming from the Big Island right now, what you've heard, uh, I'd like to say um, if we could sh put a shout out uh, from the Big Island that um, for all the community out there, uh, please uh, consider not going to Vegas and staying, on, staying in the state, come to the Big Island, spend your time on the Big Island. Um, we, we really need the support right now. A good pitch for the Big Island. We thank you all for joining us tonight. And mahalo to you for joining us. We thank our guests, of course, Sherry Bracken, radio presenter, Riley Smith, CEO at Lani Howe Properties, Eric Tonoy, president of Greenpoint Nurseries, and Deva Keola, Keola Nui, freelance graphic designer and marketing consultant. Next week, right here on Insights, while the numbers continue to grow on the neighbor islands, Oahu has seen two back-to-back -back years of net declines in the resident population. So is it too expensive, too crowded, too overcome by problems unsolved for too long? We'll hear about the quality of life for people who live right here on Oahu. That's next week right here. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii, Ahui Ho. Thank you.